Good afternoon and welcome to this week's halftime talk where we're honored to host uh, Mr. Hatem El Mosa, the CEO of Sharjah National Oil Corporation. Hatem, welcome back to the table. Hi, Sean. Since we last talked, Hatem, of course, uh, a lot of water has gone under the bridge, so to speak, uh, six, seven months into the COVID pandemic. The world has been disrupted significantly. And of course, the energy industry, oil and gas, has also been disrupted most significantly. And I'd welcome your own thoughts about six months, seven months, as we go into the fourth quarter now. Uh, what do you think are the big takeaways for the energy sector over the last number of months dealing with COVID? Well, definitely what um, the oil and gas sector specifically has gone through uh, since the beginning of this year, since um, yeah, since right the, at the very beginning of COVID, when COVID was not perceived to be such a huge uh, threat at the very beginning, uh, it's definitely something we have not, I have not seen in my career. Uh, so it's um, completely a new experience. Um, I mean, that level of demand destruction overnight was clearly colossal, but Surprisingly, the industry reacted and, 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 and I mean, was a sort of fight for survival, but nonetheless seemed to manage even that scale of challenge. Yeah, actually there is no surprise that the, uh, the sector has reacted. I mean, that's what you would ex expect from any industry. Uh, you're faced with a challenge, you have to react and uh, you have to take the right steps to uh, survive and eventually take advantage of the situation and uh, hopefully uh, turn things around uh, in a positive way. Um, I think uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, while it has caused a huge demand destruction and a big, big disruption in the oil and gas industry worldwide, it also allowed to uh, reshuffle the cards and uh, gave an opportunity to put things uh, back in order in a way. Um, what was... Like what? Like what? Yeah, I'll, just like what was happening before uh, COVID-19 um, was uh, we've gone through cycles of uh, big fluctuations in the oil prices. Uh, but what has steadily happened in the last 10 years was uh, demand reduction continuously for pick uh, or conventional oil and significant increases all the time uh, on shale oil in the uh, in the US and the main reason for that was artificial not real um, basically OPEC kept trying to uh, keep a steady uh, high price for oil and gas which was always encouraging more and more shale production to the point where the US became the highest oil producer in the world. Um, and OPEC lost a very significant chunk of its uh, production over the last 10 years. Uh, though this is not intentional on OPEC's side uh, because COVID has actually done the work of demand destruction, it opened an opportunity for things to become more like a market-based uh, uh, economy where the, the lowest the lowest cost producer produces first. Um, of course, until today, the U.S. is still producing a significant amount of oil because a huge amount of drilling has happened uh, over the last year or so. Um, but uh, as we have seen, the reduction of the number of rigs in the U.S. from 800 rigs to 250. And even though there has been a recovery in the number of rigs uh, recently, that recovery is very small compared to the uh, reduction. Now we're still not back to 300 rigs. Uh, and OPEC, yes, it has uh, cut almost 7 million barrels of production. Uh, I think at the current oil prices, uh, shale oil is not coming back uh, to the previous numbers. And it will continue eventually to drop because um, without drilling, shale cannot maintain uh, production. So eventually, if this strategy uh, continues, even though the strategy did not come intentional from OPEC, um, OPEC should be able to recover its uh, share back uh, much sooner than uh, 
shale oil will be able to recover its uh, share again. You, know, you, you take that point of the low cost producer and, and, and the activities we saw with Saudi Arabia, the world's biggest oil exporter in, in March, April, was to go to a, uh, a sort of market share posture, pump as much as you can. But they quickly abandoned that position and retreated back to the same uh, formula, controlled supply to elevate price. Uh, do you think this COVID period in any way accelerates us closer to the date at which the low cost producer will abandon this strategy of controlling supply to elevate price and move to a maximum production posture? All depends whether the decisions are driven by economic or political reasons. Um, if it is by economic reasons, what, what has happened in March was bad uh, because it caused huge price instability or market instability. Uh, OPEC's role should be to uh, achieve market stability, not the other way around. And I'm glad to see that OPEC has very quickly recovered from that uh, price war that has happened in uh, March and went back to stabilizing the market. In my opinion, um, the low cost producer should be the one that's uh, producing the highest and taking the largest uh, part of the market share, provided uh, you, you achieve a price that is high enough to give you the maximum profitability, but low enough at the same time to prevent the high cost uh, competition from coming online too early. Uh, I think that's what OPEC is doing right now, as I've stated like a couple of months ago. I think a price range between $35 to $45 is healthy to achieve that um, and should be targeted uh, for uh, the next uh, 12 months or so uh, until um, COVID-19 is behind us, hopefully. Um, yes, we have seen significant uh, price reduction uh, in the last uh, few days or a uh, couple of weeks. And that's driven primarily by the huge surge of COVID cases in the world and the uh, coming of Libyan oil uh, on the market. Um, this is- If we take that point of the, um, the, the low cost producer and, and, and the market share argument as, it, as it's referred to, interestingly, that may be coming to OPEC's direction without it necessarily being choreographed through the shale patch. But we've seen one other factor over the last six months of the current uh, COVID disruption, and that's the acceleration of the oil majors towards energy transition and their abandonment, if you like, or the retreat from uh, fossil fuels, from oil uh, uh, in particular, uh, uh, particularly the European majors. Uh, has that surprised you? How do you think that progresses forward? And particularly, where do you think the American majors will travel with that regard? I think what the oil majors are doing uh, in, the, in, the case, in the case of transition um, is mainly for survival. Survival of the companies, not survival of the industry. Um, and it is not that big at the end of the day. When you look at the uh, numbers for these oil majors, still the vast majority of their income will be coming from oil and gas, not from the renewables. It's good that um, they're doing uh, a small share in terms of renewables. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the big transition to renewables is not going to come from the oil and gas industry. It's going to come from the power industry and from the uh, government initiatives in the uh, whole market economy and the public, not from the oil and gas. For oil and gas companies, when they do renewables, first of all, they show that they're committed with a level of responsibility towards the health of our planet by supporting renewables at the same time while, while producing uh, fossil fuels. But at the end of the day, uh, oil companies are oil and gas companies. Uh, their business is to produce oil and gas at the most efficient and with the least impact from their own side on the environment. Uh, 
That's what they need to be concentrating on the most. It's the government's responsibilities and the power companies and the general society's responsibility to transition to renewables more than the oil and gas companies. We don't burn our products. We don't uh, uh, cause the huge emissions to the environment as oil and gas companies. It is everybody else that buys our products that does that. That's where so the I drive my car. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the, these companies are making choices based on what they perceive perhaps to be their investors, their, their stakeholders, uh, influence uh, uh, and their uh, sustainability. Uh, but as part of that is the reality that like we saw yesterday or, or last week, Exxon Mobil announcing their third quarter results and embedded within that was a massive cut to CapEx investment and, and, and increasingly signals that the financial power, the financial muscle to invest the scale of capital needed for new oil supply, the majors may not be able to deliver. And so the national sector may be called upon and may that be the opportunity to advance their production. I mean, how do you see those two things playing out? This is tough time for the oil industry. Um, the uh, income source to the uh, oil and gas companies, whether uh, national oil companies or IOCs, uh, has reduced significantly when the oil price dropped from $60 to $30. Um, I mean, you still have to recover all of your operating costs and your capital costs from the price, and then the balance is profit. When 50% of your income is gone, the profit is almost gone and many, for many companies. For the national oil companies, because the production uh, cost is much lower, they still make money, but uh, again, the governments count on this uh, profit to, to fund the government budgets. So it's very tough all around uh, for that. And you need the money to be able to invest and you don't have the income to make the money. So the only way to do it is uh, either stop, uh, cut your capital costs, or borrow, borrow money from the banks. Um, the banks themselves are reluctant because they see that the future for oil and gas is not as bright as it used to be in the past. And at the same time, there is the pressure groups that say, uh, tell the banks don't invest in these dirty fuels um, and uh, there will be uh, significant uh, pressure from their shareholders uh, not to uh, fund uh, projects like that. So with the uncertainty and the negative pressure, the banks themselves are reluctant. I think eventually uh, this will come around once the oil prices uh, recover back to uh, 45, 50 dollars. In the interim, what's the consequence of this scale of capex reduction? The consequence short term is eventually there's going to be a shortage of oil and gas supply because you're not going to be able to put enough money to produce. Some companies might have better balance sheets or some national oil companies may have better balance sheets to recover, but the overall impact on the sector is going to be bad. And uh, when the demand does come back up after COVID, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, produce the demand required. And the only savior of the day at that time will be shale oil because you can drill shale oil and produce almost uh, within months instead of a uh, two year project for uh, conventional oil. So the impact short term is going to be a spike in the oil prices uh, for a while until the oil sector recovers and uh, catches up. Uh, that spike. That might buy, I mean, my, 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 the point I'm, 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 I'm making is that given this window of time that we're now uh, moving into with this scale of capex reduction, uh, uh, that the low cost producer moment may be arriving. This may be the window uh, in which to seize that opportunity that may not present itself again. When you think of, you know, whatever length of time, peak oil demand, however way you want to articulate that, it's certainly been articulated that we are in the era of peak oil demand, whether it's next year, uh, five years or last year, um, and this may be the time in which to alternate the strategy and not to facilitate the return of the high cost producer. Yeah, but it depends how, many, how much power you have to do that. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's about five to seven million barrels 
of oil uh, cut, i.e. available capacity that's not being produced. And I'm pretty sure- More than that, when you consider Venezuela and uh, our other neighbors. Venezuela will be producing today if they had the capacity to do that. Uh, that uh, Venezuela's oil and gas sector is in shambles. Uh, it requires significant, huge amounts of capital investment and political willpower on the Venezuelan side and outside Venezuela. I mean, the countries that don't want Venezuela to produce to allow Venezuela to uh, come back. That's gonna take years for it to come back. Uh, but yes, there is a lot of uh, conventional oil that can be produced. It just needs money to be put there. However, if you remember, the um, demand destruction was initially like 30 million barrels. Now, a lot of it has come back, but there's still about 10 million barrels uh, demand destruction. There's about 7 million barrels spare capacity in OPEC. When the demand comes back, OPEC will just open the tap and continue opening until they run out when the tap is fully open and uh, you're still not matching the demand. And that's when- well, What's your outlook for that when you look at, uh, now we're sort of on the doorstep of 2021, uh, we've just seen all the major European economies move into lockdown. The optimistic outlook for the year ahead may be fading. We get too uh, concerned on very short term uh, changes. Um, remember, this is the second wave uh, of COVID-19. So uh, we had an improvement between the first wave and the second wave. And when you are in the middle of the wave, you feel like the whole world is crumbling and it's the end of the world and there's no future uh, anymore. Uh, we have to think a little bit uh, more in, into the future. Um, the second wave, as bad as it is, and it is very bad, uh, in most of the world, um, the numbers are very high because there is a lot more testing today than there used to be uh, in the first wave. Uh, if you actually look at the death rate in most of these countries, it's much lower than the first wave, implying that uh, they're just discovering the cases much better now than they did in the past. Nonetheless, the death rate even in this wave is very high. And that's why it's uh, the whole world uh, is going into shutdowns and close downs. Um, that's not gonna last very long. And I'm hoping that this is the last big wave that we will see of COVID-19. And I expect that we will be coming out of it even before the vaccine uh, comes uh, on stream, but not coming out, i.e. recovery, but re significantly reduced numbers. We're seeing reduced numbers in many places uh, already in the second wave, like the UAE, for example, but some other countries are still peaking. Um, so when we are out of this wave, I expect by the first quarter next year, the vaccine would be already out, more than one vaccine. And uh, we will not see another big wave like this one. Uh, we might see an, a third wave again, but it's not gonna be as big as this one. And overall, we will just see more and more gradual uh, positive improvement in the world economy and in the demand for oil and gas. Uh, overall, just slowly will be creeping up, uh, starting I mean, the forecast by the IEA OPEC is more or less around 6 million barrels of demand recovery next year. Does that still look viable to you? I think it is. By the end of next year, I think OPEC would be able to recover all of its uh, cuts back. Now, I know OPEC is planning to uh, put 2 million barrels on the uh, market uh, in January. That may be a little bit too early. But they probably don't need to make an announcement today that they will not do that. I'm, I expect they will be watching uh, how the situation develops over uh, during this month. But it's probably a month too early or um, a little bit more than a month too early to uh, increase production. I mean, However, they may even have to consider cutting more, never mind increasing. Do you think that's a realistic? They might, but you know, OPEC is not that fast in making decisions. I mean, they decided to put 2 million barrels in the market three months ago. And uh, that decision impacted the market immediately, even though none of the production came to, on the market yet. And even when they decided to cut production, they, they announced the cuts two months before that. And the market reacted even before the cuts uh, came on stream. So I think by the time they make a decision not to uh, increase production, it's gonna be probably take another month. OPEC is much slower than uh, the market. So you really can't judge by the daily fluctuations to make OPEC decisions.
I think they should delay the production increase by a month, but probably not more than a month. Uh, but eventually, I think they will get back all the 6 million barrels by the end of the year. Well, it becomes increasingly very difficult. I mean, putting market fundamentals aside, it becomes increasingly difficult to shepherd 20, no, 20 something countries, most of which are facing very stressful financial fiscal positions to continue to adhere to uh, austerity measures, if you like. As long as you see light at the end of the tunnel, and which is positive news for all of these countries, including the ones that are suffering, a premature increase in production is going to be bad for everybody, including these countries, i.e. If you produce 10% more, but you lose 20% in the price, what did you achieve? Nothing. You actually lost money. Uh, I think the best thing for OPEC is to continue adhering to the uh, market shares. And it is really not that far away before they can start. Uh, but you think only one month delay, that's enough on the increase of the 2 million? I think it is enough because we'll be out of the second wave before that. Uh, I think we'll be out of the second wave even by uh, December. Um, we're not out of COVID, but out of the peak of the second wave. 